Good overnight, welcome back to From Day One, the part three. We are ready to rock and roll, but first, we have an update on the goals. Visits to the site, that's what Boxy pays attention to, is now at, drumroll please, from 51 and change percent. Thank you all very much over so halfway there so let's grab what we've got since the last time you and i have been together of course the alien abductions with travis walton are waiting on the other side with us tonight in part two of the Midnight in the Desert interview from August 7th, 2015. We'll just take care of odds and ends here tonight. That's what we've got to do in the overnight for this playthrough. Including some arena play. So with that... We'll get Art Bell and Travis Walton on in here and get underway. Thought I had a cute. Come on. I'm gonna take it. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, this is Midnight in the Desert, exclusively on the Dark Matter Digital Network. To call the show, dial 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. A rare interview with Travis Walton, abductee, real abductee. This is not lessening anybody else's story. It's just there's so much cooperation for this that uh, I feel very comfortable in saying real abductee. Um, Travis, I get question, and by the way, people are asking, what was the movie? My goodness, uh, it is a long time ago. It's called Fire in the Sky, and you can still see it, and we've got updated stuff for you coming up. We'll tell you all about it uh, in a moment. Um, I saw it on television the night before last. It's still showing out there. It sure is. Um, and it was on Netflix last I heard. There you go. Joe wants to know what the device, the medical device you thought it was, uh, what did that look like, the one on you? Well, uh, it was glowing kind of a greenish glow coming from underneath it. So I don't know whether it was some kind of a treatment device designed to repair the damage that was uh, done internally or if it was something designed to diagnose or look inside. Mm. Uh, but okay. um, I definitely think my regaining consciousness was unexpected and actually kind of uh, put a kink in their efforts to revive me. All right. You know, for many years I thought that, that you know, I was taken aboard to, for experiments or to, uh, to torture me, but uh, it was actually probably more about reviving me. Richard asks, did Travis get the feeling that the aliens uh, didn't care whether you lived or died? In other words, did, did you feel they were caring for you, about you, or just sort of yeah, didn't? That, that, the Richard's question is related to what I was just saying, that at the time, their complete lack of emotion, I uh, interpreted it as hostility. But in total perspective, analyzing what happened, the way it fits in with the medical test afterwards, and how I was returned and everything, uh, it took me years to realize that it was probably more of an ambulance call than an abduction, that I got myself hurt, and that made it necessary to take me aboard just 
to avoid leaving me there as galactic roadkill. <laughs> um, you said you don't, you didn't feel as though you were oh, more than about an hour in total had, had passed on board the craft, yes? Yeah, uh, a very brief period of time. Of course, in a, in a state of complete hysteria, it seems like forever. But, you know, when yeah. you piece together what happened and, you know, even the waiting periods, uh, um, it was l less than I thought. You know, it uh, certainly doesn't account for the entire time. But there were little glimmers of memory, and, you know, the hypnosis reinforces this, uh, that there were blocked memories that happened that I'm unable to recollect, even after all this time, that other than what, you know, came out under that first hypnosis session. Um, what did come out under the hypnosis session? What did you find well, out? You know, uh, up to that point, I was so traumatized that I could hardly finish a sentence about it. And I had not really told the entire uh, story of what I had experienced to anyone, including my brother, until that hypnosis. And uh, it was because it was just so traumatic, I'd break down, I could hardly finish a sentence. And so uh, it, the technique was to separate the fear from the experience. Mm -hmm. and although there was a great deal of fear in what I was relating is remaining, but it was still enough to where I could tell them what happened. All right. So how did you get from the craft? I mean, we last left you going down a hall or, or passageway or something. Uh, and then what? Well, uh, my unskilled, I would say, button pushing, trying to open a door, must have attracted some attention. I don't know, maybe coincidentally, uh, this person came in that I took to be a human being from some Earth-based space agency or military uh, um, um, arm of uh, from the Earth. And uh, But I really think now that that wasn't the case. Uh, um, he took me out of this craft, and at this point, it was parked. It was inside of this big uh, hangar-like uh, um, structure. It could have been a building somewhere on a military base or somewhere. Really? Or it could have been a, a part of a larger craft. It, it had a sort of a look to the roof and wall that looked sort of like I'd seen in airplane hangars. But it it the light coming from uh, these panels could have been filtered sunlight through a translucent panel, or it might have been um, an artificial um, natural light sort of light fixture. Okay. I have no idea of where it was. I couldn't see out through these windows, or if they were windows. Um, At any point, uh, did any of these creatures uh, communicate? with you in any way, either vocally or telepathically? I think that that excruciating encounter initially with the three of them was an attempt to say something telepathically. And I was curious about why it was so excruciating until I connected to possibly that I was injured in the receiver, so to speak, wasn't operating correctly. Mm -hmm. I was interviewed uh, the same day for this new movie coming up called 701, which refers to the 701 uh, unresolved Blue Book cases. Uh, this movie is in the works yet, but um, I was interviewed the same day as the school kids from Zimbabwe. And uh, I asked uh, the young lady um, what that felt like when these, you know, I don't know if you heard about this, but there were, you know, if everyone heard about this thing where there's like 60 kids at recess in broad daylight, this craft came down, these aliens, uh, like I've described, came out and communicated to them through this stare. And I wanted to know if it was excruciating like for them, like it was for me. Yeah. And they said, no, it was very pleasant. The message wasn't un unpleasant. It was friendly. And so that convinces me all the more that it was just an attempt with extreme aggressiveness, force of the combined force of the three of them trying to get, get control of me before I hurt them or uh, actually hurt myself because I think 
my uh, unscheduled regaining of consciousness interrupted uh, some life-saving repairs. And so um, that's the reason for uh, a human-looking person to come in and take me out. Fully human? And I think, uh, apparently, in most ways, there was something odd about the eyes. But again, I go back to the biology. See, Skep are really fond of saying, this is ridiculous. There are no aliens because everybody reports bi uh, bipedal, two hands, two legs, uh, you know, a head on top. Right. Oh, they're not going to look anything like that. They're going to be a tentacle octopus. Well, that's ridiculous. If you understand the principles of biology, bilateral, bilateral symmetry is almost, uh, you know, um, throughout all life on Earth, no, no matter how diverse it is. And um, you have many cases where animals that resemble each other very, very much are completely unrelated just because they are in a similar ecological niche, a mm -hmm. certain similar environment. Sure. Uh, uh, These creatures were, were they wearing helmets, or were they breathing? If well, they the were human breathing, looking ones, uh, the 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 human the, one, um, what so-called greys, um, were not wearing anything but coveralls. But the the human looking one uh, was wearing a helmet over his head, huh. and so that was the reason I sort of accepted the fact that he was not responding to my babbling, my screaming, begging questions. You know. Uh, All right, I'm going back to my computer for a second here with, that, with a question. Yes, I, I, I've got it. Um, Heather would like to know, uh, she may have information. Is it true Travis was found to have radiation signatures in his blood that can only be found if a person is exposed to radiation, like in space, outside of Earth's atmosphere? Uh, that is a, an untrue rumor. Um, unfortunately, that specific test was not performed, uh, that kind of evidence might have been uh, apparent had they done such a test. Uh, however, the trees nearest where the craft came down do uh, have definite markers of having a huge radiation dose. Wow. And we can get into that in detail, but this, this accelerated growth that was generated in these trees has been uh, duplicated in the pine trees. It's a Scots pine uh, tree species near the Chernobyl nuclear accident. It's very similar to Ponderosa pine, where this forest uh, was. And uh, the radiation uh, at Chernobyl caused an accelerated growth there, just like it did at the clearing. Now, the trees nearest where the craft came down had the greatest accelerated growth, and then the effect uh, faded back into the woods. And um, most interestingly, the most recent discovery was that the accelerated growth was primarily um, on the side of the tree in the direction of the craft. So in a circle of trees around where the craft came down, the the thickened growth would be on the east, west, south, or north, or whatever side was facing the craft, which completely undercuts any skeptic's idea that there was some growth effect um, that had nothing to do with the craft. This uh, is all new information to me. Um, it's new research, yes. When was this outed? This was discovered in an expedition uh, overseen by Ben Hansen. He was the um, uh, host of the uh, TV series uh, Fact or Fake, uh -huh. former FBI agent. He oversaw uh, an expedition back there, and we were able to check uh, that this accelerated growth, which we were aware of from going way back, but we didn't know it was directional until this last year uh, when uh, we were able to get a complete cross-section of the trees. Um, and uh, this high radiation was detected with Geiger counters mm -hmm. uh, um, on the men's hard hats uh, during the search. And also, um, when I exited the, uh, the truck, I left the door open. Right. And the crewman that was in the open doorway was Ken Peterson. And his right arm, the arm towards 
the open door, has recently been diagnosed with skin cancer, oh. which again is a um, sign of maybe radiation. Yeah, some high radiation coming at them. <laughs> um, so, um, no, the blood tests uh, didn't reveal that, uh, but uh, unfortunately, those kind of tests weren't run at the time. Yes, indeed. Um, since the experience, have you noticed any changes in yourself? Psychic abilities, better understanding of yourself or anybody else or life itself. In other words, did it profoundly change you in some way? All of the above, all of the above. But uh, I'd rather not get into that stuff. I, you know, I, I, I have tried very hard to stick to things that I can document. Right. And, um, and some things became documentable later, so I was able to talk about them later. Like the radiation, but you, uh, you're, you're trying to avoid the woo-woo factor. Right. <laughs> I get but that. There's some, definitely some strange things that uh, have come become apparent. All right. Let me get, again, um, so you were in this hangar-like place. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to know how you got back to, I don't know. Earth, Earth. Well, he took me uh, to some other people who dressed similarly to him, except they didn't have helmets. And so I thought, well, maybe they can hear me. Maybe they'll answer my questions. Right. And, you know, I was a I was a babbling idiot. I was screaming, crying, you know, carrying on. Uh, I was basically out of my mind with fear. But they weren't responding to me. And in a way, you know, it might not have been so much secrecy or, you know, anything covert or suspicious that, that they wouldn't respond to me. It was just that I was acting like a maniac and they felt that Todd had a reason with somebody so out of control was would be futile. Mm -hmm. So uh, they forced me down on this table and rendered me unconscious with some sort of a, a, a gas. And uh, boom. Uh, next thing I woke uh, was back on Earth. But where where were you when you woke up back on Earth? Where were you? It it showed you at a in the movie at a gas station or something. Right? Well, I woke up and I was lying face down in the dark uh, on a cold pavement. But there was a when I looked to see where the light was coming from. But it went off. Uh, but when I looked up, I could still see the shiny bottom of this craft hovering there just for an instant before it shot straight up into the air. But I think probably quite a bit of time uh, went on between the time I was put unconscious and the time I was uh, lying there on the pavement. I could feel that my clothes were still warm, even though the pavement was very cold, the air was very cold. All right, the movie showed you naked as a jaybird. Not true. Not true. Not true. You know, it was dreadful. I mean, they actually filmed a sequence where um, the actor portraying me uh, came upon a couple getting busy in a car. They're naked, and he's naked, and they start screaming, he starts screaming. They said it was so bad that it was mercifully uh, deleted from the film. Uh, but I guess the, the nakedness uh, is a good metaphor for the feeling of, that I had uh, uh, in a variety of ways that these beings, uh, the, the small ones, could look into me. They could, they could, they knew what I was thinking. They could see into me. It was an intrusive, invasive kind of feeling. And then in the aftermath, the way the media microscopically analyzed my every move to an absurd extent, every, you know, childish <laughs> uh, act of bravado or whatever, you know, motorcycle stunts or whatever was just blown out of proportion. And, uh, you know, they were just looking for anything that they could interpret as strange. So, you know, the whole idea of being the bug in the jar began uh, on board the craft and continued for months after I was returned. All right, hold it right there. We're gonna we're gonna break. Whew. Travis Walton is my guest. He's an abductee. Been there, done that. And again, we'll return as soon as they finish with their musical bumper here on Midnight in the Desert.
out of one and into the second bumper, so we should be back with them in just a few seconds. Digital Network. To call the show, please direct your finger digits to dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. A rare interview with Travis Walton, abductee. Um, okay, Travis, uh, here's one for you. Um, you talked to us about the aliens and then what seemed to be more human-like characters. So an obvious question would seem to be, um, do you think that that means that we know all about the aliens, that we are in some way co cooperating with them? You got taken because they perhaps thought you were hurt. They didn't want you. They didn't want you to wake up. And when you did, they wanted you the hell out of there. And so um, those humans that you say you saw may have been, well, who knows, government uh, types. Is that possible? Well, that's possible, and that's what I initially thought. But now, you know, going further into the skeptic's idea that no way would they even be vaguely humanoid, let alone human-looking, is, is preposterous uh, when you look at the biology behind it. It's entirely possible that they're not us from the future, or us from the past, or related to us, or that we were seated here by them. It's entirely possible that they uh, just have a particular keener interest in us because of our similarity, which is just coincidental. Hmm. I predict that when we look at life on other worlds, they're not going to be astonished at how bizarre these life forms are. They're going to be amazed at the similarity of forms. Uh, there's, there's, they uncovered a fossil of a marsupial that is built just like a saber-toothed cat. It was a predator, and yet biologically completely unrelated, but, but very, very similar because of the niche that it filled in the ecology. We have javelina in the southwest that look like pigs, have tusks and uh, behaviors in so many ways like pigs, and they're not pigs at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the American pronghorn is not even a true antelope, and it resembles so much a particular African antelope species because our American pronghorn evolved here on the American continent in the presence of the American cheetah, which is now extinct. And because of the similarity in the environment, it takes on a similar form and a similar ability. Every animal that winds up living in the water, whether it be a mammal, a bird, or a, or a reptile, or an amphibian, they all come to look very fish-like because the environment shapes the animal. Okay, but clearly you were looking at two different species. I mean, you were looking at yeah. what, aliens and at something close to human. Yeah, and I think that they were brought in, um, summoned, or um, their assistance was gained because of the, um, A, I would be less combative, and they would be able to get some degree of cooperation and get me uh, sedated to the point where they could finish the repairs, and B, uh, they would know more and probably have more equipment and whatnot to deal with the nature of my injuries, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it took five days. Okay. Dale asks, uh, again, this is from uh, the wormhole, do you, do you still have nightmares about this event? I did for a long time, but that gradually faded away. Now, the dreams that came back 
later uh, were not so much nightmares, but actually featured the uh, human-type people uh, to a much greater extent, but huh. with a much different uh, emotional feel to it. Fascinating. Um, I haven't kept up on all the other guys uh, who were on your crew, or Mike's crew. Um, obviously, we're going to get a pretty good feel for how you're doing these days, which thankfully is pretty good. How are the other guys doing? Do you do you know? Well, um, come to find out, Alan Dallas uh, had a heart attack and died uh, here a couple of years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. And last year, I found out that Dwayne Smith had also passed away from a heart attack. And, you know, I had had a, quite a bit of difficulty tracking Dwayne Smith down. I had a friend who was a former police officer who enlisted the help of a friend who was a private detective, found him. I, I talked to him on the phone, interviewed him. And fortunately, I taped the interview because, you know, he agreed that he would come out and speak with me. But, you know, he had some real problems with his teeth and he wanted to get them fixed before he'd appear on camera. Right. Uh, but he passed away uh, Thanksgiving before last. Wow. Wow. Um, so many are gone is the answer. And yeah. Right. Two of them have gone. Uh, Mike's had some health problems with some strokes and whatnot, but he's he's fought back pretty good. He's back to actually, you know, doing uh, tree work. He does residential tree service now. Huh. Um, uh, John Gallet uh, is back in the area locally, and and so is Ken. He moved back into this area. All right. Would you? Um, I I want to plug uh, what you you've got a documentary, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, and also um, whatever else you've got going on. So there is new information uh, out there that people can get, and we're going to tell them how. What I would, yeah. what I really would like to do is, uh, would you mind answering a few phone calls? Absolutely. Good, good. Travis Walton is my guest. If you want to call us, the public number is area code 952-225-5278. Rare opportunity. 952-225-5278. North America, meaning America and Canada, can get us at MITD. 51 on Skype, MITD51. If you're outside North America or Canada, you can call uh, on Skype using MITD55. That's MITD55. So if you have a question for him, and I can't imagine you don't, pick up the phone or pick up Skype and join us. Travis Walton, Midnight in the Desert. Ian will return after they return from their musical bumper. Matter news, I'm Leo Ashcraft. The increase in availability of drones is all but certainly to cause an airplane accident, in part because it's difficult to catch people in the act of flying the small unmanned drones. CBS News aviation and safety expert Chelsea Sullenberger said Sunday that we've seen what a six-pound or an eight-pound bird could do to bring down an airplane. She said on Face the Nation, a nod to the flock of the birds that knocked out both of the engines and forced him to land a plane in the Hudson River in 2009. Imagine what a device containing hard parts like batteries and motors can do that might weigh 25 or possibly up to 55 pounds to bring down an airplane. It's not a matter of if it will happen, it's a matter of when it will happen. There's been a dramatic increase in the number of unmanned aircraft flying near commercial planes, and in some cases, pilots have had to alter their courses to avoid a collision. Solenberger said the devices are becoming ubiquitous because they are relatively cheap and easy to procure, but that it allows people to do stupid, reckless, dangerous things with abandon. 
He says he's encouraged that aviation and the legal authorities have raised the penalties for doing these things, adding that the essential element that's still missing is the certainty of prosecution because it's been difficult to catch them in the act. Well, the Mars rover has been producing quite a few interesting photographs, to say the least, lately. One appears to be a ghostly woman, and another one may indicate an infestation of crabs on Mars. This recent Mars photograph seems to show a giant alien crab. Well, the mysterious object closely resembles the crustacean anyway. It's unknown exactly who found it, but it's really interesting. It does appear alive. It may be a crab-like animal, or it might also be a plant. This object has many arms, and one of them goes to the left of the picture a very long ways. That arm is longer than all the others. Plant or animal, well, it really doesn't matter. The significance of this may be that it might show signs of life on Mars. Take a look at the photos yourself, and let us know what you see at darkmatternews.com. It's Friday. That means open line night on Art Bell. Let us know what you think of the stories on Dark Matter News tonight. And remember, you can always submit a tip online at darkmatternews.com. After last night's show on Bigfoot, we've had earthquakes, meteors, asteroids, UFOs, volcanic activity, and something has shaken loose. Bigfoot, Yeti, the Sasquatch, the abominable snowman, whatever you may call it, showed up today in North Carolina. Little Eric and little dog Yippy, they caught it firsthand and on video. The recording is of a Sasquatch mating call, war scream, or a greeting from some other dimension. Here it comes. It continues to haunt me. In the terrifying last few moments of Art Bell's show, Final Caller came in with a recording, a recording that still sends chills down my spine. I guess, do you want me to end your show with what I would think may be a Bigfoot scream that I heard out there in the woods in southeast Oklahoma? I or... wouldn't miss it for the world, man. Go ahead. <laughs> and with North Korea rolling their time back 30 minutes, you may not even have heard this yet. And for those of you following politics... Fox News and Facebook will no longer be hosting GOP debates. The WWE has picked up the contract. And after Trump's shrewd remarks during the debate, Rosie O'Donnell fires back with this crazy tweet. It continues to haunt me. This is John G. with Dark Matter News. Don't know if I should do a parody skit of a EBC technical fault here. The equipment says everything's still running, but as you can plainly hear, the numbers oh, uh, by now, I hope. There we go. Uh, there is going to be um, an upcoming documentary. In other words, there has been a lot of information since all this happened, since uh, the movie was made. Not everything in the movie was just so. So there's a brand new, I guess brand new, 90-minute documentary called Travis. Um, tell us about it. Well, uh, it's uh, produced by On Wings Production. That's O-N-W-I-N-G-E-S right. production. Uh, dot com. And um, it interviews a lot of the prominent researchers in the fields, some who have been active, 
since it happened originally and some more recent to the scene, but... Uh, all about your case. All, yes, all about my case. It's a 90-minute uh, film. It's won a couple of EBE awards, and uh, it's really a fantastic uh, film, very thorough uh, account. Boy, we're getting some interference on this line. I don't know if you can hear it on your end or not. Uh, we've, yeah, I hear it. Uh, you do. We had uh, some uh, sabotage attempt on our local fiber optic n uh, node, and uh, oh, oh, that would account for the the little breakup I hear, uh, as well as the yeah. as well as the static. All right. So this Someone documentary went and took a shotgun to various uh, wonderful fiber optic junctions. Wonderful. I bet that's fun to fix. Um, anyway, this documentary. Where can people get it? How how is it obtained? Well, uh, like I said, uh, through onwingsproductions.com or uh, through my website, travelswalton.com. Excellent. Um, also, you've got a conference coming up, right? Yeah. Uh, this is the 40th uh, anniversary of the event, and we've got quite a lineup of speakers. Uh, Tracy Torme, who was the original screenwriter on uh, Flash Guy, will be there. And uh, his co-producer on 701, the movie, uh, James Fox, will also be speaking. Uh, we've got David Childress, uh, Ben Hansen, uh, Lee Spiegel from the Huffington Post, um, a UFO um, editor, Paola Harris. Oh, Lynn Katai will be speaking about the Phoenix Lights. And um, I've got Robert... Uh, uh, um, um, Morning, Scott. Uh, Yuri Arti and okay. Noe Torres. They wrote a book called Cowboys and Aliens, and it, I think it's fascinating to go back to the prehistory of UFOs and show that this is not some kind of a phenomenon exclusive to post-Roswell. Um, I mean, uh, this goes way back, reports uh, in, in the um, American Southwest. All right, here's a big question. Gilberto wants to know uh, by computer, were you ever debriefed, it's a good question, by any government agency about the abduction experience? I would think they would be interested. You would think they would, and it's very, very curious that I have received <laughs> no interest from any government agency. Now, uh, it was widely uh, suspected for a long time that our chief debunker uh, for many years, Philip Class, was acting as some kind of a covert disinformationist on behalf of some uh, government agency. And um, he harassed the heck out of Mike Rogers, and he off to, you know, discredit it. And this bribe offer is, is well documented. It, it was carried by local deputy uh, James Click. And um, you, Art, um, challenged Philip Glass to take a polygraph test on the air. I did. Call. Yes. And uh, you got quite a bit of backlash over that. Well, you have been vindicated. Uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, after Class passed away, his FBI file revealed some very interesting stuff that I wish you had been able to get Philip Class to take a polygraph test because I think he would have flunked it in regards to his covert disinformation as well. Well, I don't think anybody in the audience is surprised that that kind of thing is going on. All right, let's see who we've got. Um, Richard, uh, somewhere out in the world, you're on with uh, Travis. Hi. Good morning, Art. It's Richard from Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, and, okay. Yeah. And uh, great show as always. And a big shout out to Belga. And I have a question for Travis. Okay. Uh, you know what the internet's like, Travis? And uh, there was a suggestion a few years ago that perhaps what you stumbled upon was some great government project. And in fact, the whole alien thing was a result of hallucinogens force-fed to you. Is there any truth or any possibility that's the case? No, there's no possibility to that. You know, uh, 
that was kind of a theory that uh, was put forth because people were desperate to explain it away. And, you know, well, why does he pass a lie detector test? Well, he believes it happened. So he really hallucinated it, and it didn't really happen, but he thinks it did. But, you know, that theory uh, and the transitory psychosis theory and, and, and another one involving hypnosis – uh, have no basis because it doesn't explain how seven people can have an identical hallucination. Really? really? All right, uh, let's go also, to... Also, also, medical yes. tests show no trace of any drug in my body. Thank you. Scott, uh, you're on the air with uh, Travis. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, hi. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, Travis, I have a question for you. Do you think that uh, the spotlight on you, because uh, uh, now you have a... Uh, celebrity status do you think that um now that the e now that you have a celebrity status maybe the ets are uh, kind of backing away from you a little bit <laughs> uh, i don't know uh, if that were uh, a, a security measure then, then okay but uh, uh i don't know you know here at february 4 last um i was driving uh leaving a um mufon meeting in la I was going uh, let's see, north up the 5 towards the 10 to come back to Arizona. I was with my girlfriend and my son, and we saw a, a giant triangular black craft come low overhead, um, you know, undeniable, <laughs> incredibly close. And I was astonished that you would have something over a, a city the size of L.A. and not have all kinds of reports. Well, we did a little research online. My son found this uh, website called um, ufostalker.com, and at that exact time and place, there were uh, over a dozen r reports of the same thing. So others saw it, too. I saw one of them, Travis, a big triangular craft. Um, Scott, anything else? Well, yes. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I live over here in Massachusetts, actually, um I had I, I I had a sighting myself actually, but it was more of a uh, ring of light. Uh, have either you, Art, or um, Travis, uh, heard of uh, like a um, a ring of light that would float above somebody? Because that's actually what I saw uh, above myself. Uh, it came uh, I don't know about ten feet above my vehicle actually, and it was um, it came really close and it floated really close and then it just ascended right up in the sky uh, i was um okay well wondering... that, that that would be a big no for me what about you travis any ring i've there? heard of such reports but i haven't seen such a thing myself i'm sure everybody comes to you now with every story i mean I, they do with me uh it's it's yeah. you know once they know that you're open to that kind of thing they really come to you a lot mm -hmm. so let's go to uh i don't know yorkton is that correct saskatchewan perhaps Yes, absolutely correct again there, Art. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call, and hello, uh, Travis. I actually have hello. two questions. Um, I have two questions. First one is, um, do you think that the aliens are here to help us? Because you always hear that there's uh, the negative experiences, but do you think that they're here for the good or the bad is the first question. Well, you know, this is just my opinion, and it mostly speaks to the in, uh, species that I encountered, and I really do not see them as malevolent. Um, however, I think that there is something that's, you know, been uh, suggested in science fiction as the prime directive, the non-interference directive, that it's against the rules to overtly infuse any kind of technology because, you know, that's like giving matches to kids, you know, yeah. we're just going to use it to hurt ourselves. So it makes sense that they're not going to do it. And I, I can expound on this a little further. You know, the skeptics are fond of saying, if this was real, they'd land on the White House lawn and say, here we are, Mr. President. That's right. But I also posit that with their level of technology so far beyond ours, that they are perfectly capable of doing everything that they're doing here and remain completely undetected. There would be no ufology. There would be no sightings. They could accomplish that, I sure. believe. Sure. So... You have to explain why it's neither extreme. In my view, this, these glimpses, which are just uh, barely provable enough to, to let 
this knowledge, this awareness filter through the population in a way that doesn't have the kind of overwhelming disruptive effect that just instant open disclosure would have. Right. Caller? That sounds great. Um, and one more quick question, if I can. Did he, uh, uh, Travis, did you see any more people up there with you, or is it just uh, you? Okay. Uh, well, there were some other human-looking beings, but, you know, like in the movie where there were human cadavers and that's, uh, or artifacts of other people having been there, no, I did not see that. All right. Off to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Hello. That's right. Hello, uh, Art. How's it going? It's going okay. Turn your radio or whatever off, please. Yep, we'll do right now. Okay. Got it. All right. Yep. Proceed. All right. Hi, I have a question for Travis. Um, it's part of pop, uh, pop culture that the uh, aliens, when they abduct you, they uh, stick probes in you. Is mm -hmm. there any truth to that? Um, you mean, did it uh, happen to Travis? Were, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. it happened to Travis. Did right. they like, actually penetrate him with any probes? Or did right, they right. Okay, I, I've got it. Um, they showed in the movie about the most horrible scene anybody could imagine with this needle coming to Travis's trapped eye. Oh, God, that was awful. I'm so glad that didn't happen to you, Travis. Um, any other, anything else? Well, there was an array of instruments there uh, laid out. I had great apprehension about how they might have been used initially, thinking that, you know, some bizarre effects could come out later. But I really think that they were just simply there to try to help. And uh, so I don't think anything, I have no conscious memory of any probing or anything. I think uh, what was done medically was just to correct a, a terrible accident that I brought on myself by getting too close mm -hmm. unexpectedly. Got it. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Scott. Hello, Scott, on Skype. You're on the air. Hi, Travis. Um, get I, I get closer to your computer, sir. You sound like you're in a deep hall somewhere. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. Uh, Art and Travis, it's great to talk to you both. Um, it's Scott in Vancouver. I'm listening to uh, you on uh, TuneIn Radio. Yes, and, sir. Uh, this is one of the most fantastic stories, obviously, that I've ever heard. Um, you know, my I've, I've heard Travis speak over the years, and I, the only thing I – a few people have touched on it. What have you, has time woken any memories up that might have been buried? Has has anything come forward that might have been uh, hidden before? Did, what what was, did, was there a message? I mean, you hear about these kids in, in South Africa that were, were, it was imparted to them that we have to save the planet. Was there any direct message to you? Mm -hmm. So a few questions kind of combined there, and uh, I'll listen off there. All right, all right. Travis? Well, um, back about the time I was doing so many interviews for the movie, I started having these memories, little dreams or whatever, glimmers coming through the, involving the human-looking type of people. And I went to Tracy Torme, the screenwriter on the film, and I asked him, uh, do you think that there could be some memories returning? And he said, no. He said, it's probably just, you know, you know, because you're doing all these interviews that it's probably just dreams. Mm. And so uh, I asked him the same question here recently, and he says, oh, yeah, there was probably memories leaking back through. So he he profoundly changed his opinion. But none of those memories, uh, you know, uh, really constitute any useful information. They were just glimmers of things. It was definitely had a much more positive feeling than the earlier nightmares that I had. You're a very lucky guy because there was so much cooperation. A lie detector tests. I mean, so many people, witnesses, the whole schmear. You had it all. There are other abductees who tell stories, but without that kind of cooperation. Do you have any uh, feelings about the whole abduction phenomenon, people who tell these stories? I think there's a whole mix of things going on. It's a, it's a, uh, um, a variety of things, all of the above, actually. You know, some of it is extremely vivid memory. Some of it is delusion. Some of it is misidentified ordinary things. But I believe there's a core reality here of other e events and sightings and things that have happened. 
And just because someone is unable to document it doesn't mean it's not true. But, you know, in terms of trying to get the public to become aware that there is a core reality here, that's the reason I stick to documentation. It's not like that's what you have to have, but that's you know, for it to be true, but that's what you need to have in order to bring people along and make them realize we're not alone and this is real. You're right. You dropped a sort of a hint earlier that there have been changes in you that you don't really want to describe. And I jumped and said because of the woo-woo factory factor. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I'm i dying to know what they are. Uh, but All right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I can document. Really? I didn't okay. want to say anything about the health effects because I couldn't document it. But I went into my employers and got the documentation that I never called in sick one time in the last 39 years. Wow. And so that's wow. unusual. That's unusual. It's extremely unusual. Are you kidding? 39 years? Yeah. You, you never called in sick once? No. no so no. if anything, you got a health benefit? Uh, possibly. I mean, it could be a coincidence that I'm healthy. But, uh, you know, I never never uh, missed a day of work except for funerals and things, you know. <sighs> uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, your turn with... Uh, uh, Travis Walton, hi. Hi, good to both of you. Very interesting. I missed the very beginning of the show. Where did this happen? Uh, it happened uh, south of uh, Heber Overgard, Arizona. Okay. Uh, up on the Mogollon Rim, over 7,000 feet elevation, up in the Ponderosa Pines of the Sitgreaves National Forest, very near the border to the Apache uh, Reservation. And um, you talked about when they left you out of the craft or whatever it was, you were in some kind of a hangar, is that it? Yeah, apparently, either a hangar or maybe possibly a larger craft. Uh, and how did you get out of that? Uh, well, I was rendered unconscious, and but when I woke up, I was returned. So, uh, obviously, they transported me to uh, a vehicle after I was underconscious and and brought me back. And in a way that really just uh, reinforced my theory that uh, it was with concern for my welfare. I mean, they could have dumped me off on some asteroid or even back in the woods where it happened, where I would have froze to death before I got help. So but you didn't know the time that was happening, right? You didn't know when you were being transported. You didn't, that, that, that you, you have no, no consciousness of that at all, right? Right. Yeah. Wow. They kept me out. Wow. Well, blocked memories. I, I do think with the, these little glimmers that have been coming through, that at least part of that time I wasn't in a coma or under anesthesia, that part of the time I, there was some kind of interaction, especially with these human-looking beings. Okay. The documentary name again? Uh, is Travis. <laughs> I didn't name it. That's not my ego play in there. They named it Travis. <laughs> Oh, and, uh, you deserve a documentary name. No problem. We'll tell we'll tell everybody how to get it. Stay right there. We're uh, up against break. It'll be a quick one, and we'll be right back. Travis Walton is my guest. His story is uh, always the same. A few new things, but always the same. And with that, we will leave Midnight in the Desert for tonight. We will pick it up tomorrow for part three where the callers try to pick apart the proposed alien abduction Travis Walton so you will want to be back for that in part three tomorrow night with a little bit of time we do have left Let's collect our two missions here in Elemental Season we completed. And see what our new prize is. And it's Skin Stones of the Strength Variety. If we had somebody who had sponsored the ticket, we'd actually be getting 15,000 pet foods at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, today is energy day. Okay, kind of like leg day. And with a day and 14, there won't be anything to do for this, but there will be, from all reports, a incoming new task to do. For the events coming in for the weekend at Guild Reset Time tonight. So there will be want to go ahead and minimize activity there until we do know what task should or shouldn't be attempted as a result. So, with that being said, let's go back up Continue to knock on Heaven's door to see if we might be able to punch our way in on that one task over at Hidden Valley Ranch to finish out our last couple minutes of today's episode. Actually, since we're going to do it kind of like a cappella, let's bring in the Sounds of Dominion. So at least we have something auditory. To keep people at least somewhat interested in these final minutes. So, with a Russian team over on the Mercury Guild, with an 84k squad of fire, which is not a great matchup for me, let's give her a run. Yeah, that's interesting. We turned on the audio, but we're still playing this fight in the Kabuki sense. just win that? I think we did. Seriously, I, I swore we set up the audio. Why? Yeah, there's audio. I don't know why it's still playing Hidden Valley Silent. Less. Ah, seriously? My apologies, folks. That's going to be all on me. Had the game playing machine on 
mute at the hardware level. Now it should be fixed. And with the sounds of Dominion in the cross server, Tournament of the Elements. Switch back in Araji, see if it does any better. I think there might not be enough punch. The other way. But while that fight loads, we actually have an update on the stats. The new boxy number is. Drumroll, please. Wow. 53.06%. Thank you all very much. As we approach closer and closer to having that sexy vixen boxy actually pay attention to all of us. Alrighty, back to the fight. Away we go. Now with 100% more Raji. better improvement, but I don't think it's a win, no. All right, well, let's just punch enough to hopefully trigger the treasure chest level, and then we'll probably call it a session. So to do that, we'll put these fights in speed up mode. Teams being about 25k above us, we're not really expecting to win these fights, but we can scrape some points out. We get a card. Wait a minute, wait a minute, this is a 2 2 1. That's gonna be a full win. 
Let's see, is there any other two two ones? No, there isn't. Okay, that was the only two two one. Remember, folks, never, 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 never set your Titans up in a two two one format. Now, that might actually have to be our first piece of apparel. Friends don't let friends set themselves to be in a 2 2 1 format. And we'll have to figure some kitschy way of doing it. But, eh. Pieces of our first goodie comes here. So with that, we will draw a day to a close here on from day one. And no, I'm not going to do an old 70s, 80s kind of like TV sign off, but you know, that might be cool someday to pull off at the end of this. Of course, make sure you do like, share, and subscribe to go ahead and get us up to those goals for both Boxy Nexters, which we just updated, and YouTube. Of 5,000 views and 1,000 subscribers, so both of them start paying attention, sending us items that we can send to you, the watchers of the show. Coin based items detailed below. Go ahead and follow that to get yourself $10 free of Bitcoin, which Nexters will allow you to use in Dominion for your purchases, whether it be emeralds, Valkyrie favor, or anything else your heart desires. And those Coinbase earn two-minute lessons, one-question quizzes for up to $100 in free crypto. Until next time, it's always a great new world to release the Krakens. Like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you tomorrow as we continue from day one.